My name is Carl Hazlitt. I started with RCA Broadcast uh, 35 years ago. It was uh, this month in 1980, and I worked for Broadcast up until uh, the division was closed, just prior to the uh, GE purchase. So I worked for maybe a month or two as RCA recording systems on the government side, and then it was transferred to, or became GE at that point. Do you remember your first job assignment? Yes, I do. Could you talk about <laughs> it a little bit? My first assignment was to, I came into the magnetic tape group of broadcast, and they were getting the TR-800 ready for, um, they had just unveiled it at the NAB show, in Las Vegas, and it was a big hit. It was a, a very uh, sophisticated uh, tape recorder, a big advance in uh, being able to do special effects right on the tape recorder itself. My first assignment was to draw a block diagram of that unit for the instruction books because, of course, they did all the engineering, got that all out of the way. They're ready to start producing them to give the customers, and they didn't have instruction books. So as a fresh out of college, but with some broadcast background, they had me uh, go around and talk to all the engineers to get each of the individual pieces so I could draw a single block diagram for the whole unit. Um, did you have any kind of a mentor or anything when you started? Yes, I did. Um, the guy I remember most was um, uh, Walt. Murdoch. He was uh, probably about my age now. He knew everybody in the plant. There was like 4,000 people here then in RCA and all the different parts of RCA. He seemed to know everything about the place, where everything was. As you go down the hall, there was nobody who didn't give a wave to him and say hi. Um, and he taught me a lot about getting, you know, where things were and getting a good foothold on a, my career in the broadcast group. And he was very knowledgeable on uh, electrical circuits, things like that, too. And also, um, for a more theoretical mentor, was Bob Thomas. He was like the uh, senior design video engineer and uh, enjoyed working with him a lot. Okay, that's great. Um, as far as uh, major projects that you worked on, what stands out? What do you remember? Well, the, the TR-800, getting that into production and demoing it to different people. Um, we were on the forefront of what everybody now thinks of as HDTV back then and trying. Even then, we knew that television needed to be improved. So we embarked on a project to make uh, what they call component recording. And we stunned the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers by showing up at a meeting that they were going to talk about doing equipment and how they might do this. We stunned them by showing up with a recorder that actually did what they were thinking in theory. Like nobody knew we were working on it. We did it under our advanced development work. Uh, so that was uh, quite a, an accomplishment and uh, something that, you know, really kept us in the forefront for a couple of years. And also, uh, when we um, eventually were just doing a lot of camera work, it was the development of the first CCD cameras for electronic news gathering, including a uh, special shuttered one that allowed us to do freeze frames. Uh, for example, we shot some video at the racetrack and did the equivalent of a photo finish using that camera. That was the first time, because normal television cameras in those days were all blurry if you tried to actually shoot something that was moving fast. Um, so, how do you think RCA valued you as a part of the project? I think even right up to the end, at, at least in the broadcast division, which is like where I was most of the time, um, very much so, um, because we... Um, I don't, uh, it's part of the reason I'm still here with the, uh, all the, through the follow-on companies because um, 
some of the people that were involved then are still here too. And it, uh, um, I mean, we had all kinds of other activities going on that were supported. Um, just it was like a family. I mean, we had uh, uh, first of all, we had a great relationship on being able to buy any RCA products, <laughs> the family store as it was called in those days, that kind of uh, thing where they had uh, things of value for the employees. We had, back when we had the 4,000 some people here, we had two bowling leagues. Those were well supported by the by the company. Uh, we had softball games. We had uh, uh, Christmas parties for each of the individual sections as well as an overall Christmas party. And I, um, there was recognition for us within our um, uh, technical community too. Uh, you know, either promotions or uh, special on-the-spot award type things. So I, it was uh, it was very uh, enjoyable to work for, for RCA. You use the term family. We've heard a lot about the RCA family. Um, what's it mean to you? Well, um, when I came in, there was about six or seven of us that hired in within that year. And we, in addition to hanging around with some of the older employees, we kind of formed, I don't know, a wouldn't call it a clique, but it was a, a group of us. You know, we did a lot of things outside of that. We'd go to uh, happy hours, for example, for on, on Fridays. Um, a lot of us were on those bowling teams I mentioned. Um, we had some other interests like uh, scale model railroading, things like that, that we got together outside, and that's why it was more than uh, just a 9 to 5 or 8 to 5 type of job. I think that's the best way to describe it. It was, um, uh, and, and like the older managers as well as uh, as engineers were pretty, uh, I, like friendly and just interested in, in things that were going on besides what you were working on. For example, uh, this is kind of a funny story. I had. Uh, I guess it was about uh, around 1985. I bought a boat <laughs> off of Paul Morocco, who was by then the um, government communications recording manager. He had bought the boat from Charlie Rockfuss, who was the mechanical <laughs> uh, uh, manager for that group. And then I ended up selling the boat to another engineer in the group. <laughs> so it was that kind of a thing where you knew so much about what other people did and, and their outside activities that you, you kind of uh, shared experiences and things like that. So um, that's just the kind of thing that, you know, is like a family. Talk about your coworkers at work. Well, um, We were, uh, yeah, there was kind of two groups of us. There was the younger guys who would all come in right there in 1980 because they were staffing up for uh, this push toward high de higher definition television as well as digital recording. Um, we, we would go to lunch together uh, all the time, actually. Um, being we were younger and all of us at that time were single, uh, we would go to the, there were maybe six or seven lunch places right around here because of, again, 4,000 some people plus Campbell's Soup. One thing we rarely actually did was ate in the RCA cafeteria. We would tend to, again, we had a little bit of uh, free cash, <laughs> freer cash maybe than the older folks. And uh, so we would go up the street to Shirley's or George's uh, or the New York Deli place, uh, places like that to, to eat lunch. So we actually eat lunch together almost all the time. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like working with them? Oh, um, it was good. We we were all from uh, the different schools. Like, you know, was, I was from Lehigh University. Um, one of the other fellows was from Drexel. 
There was a young man I remember, this was especially interesting. He actually was one of the Vietnamese children airlifted out of Saigon, then went to school in Texas because his, his family, or he had family in Texas, was able to go there and become educated. And he spoke excellent English by the time he became an engineer. His name was P.T. Chung. And he was, uh, it was so interesting to be able to listen to some of his stories, but he was a real hard worker. Uh, and just to understand, you know, somebody coming here under those circumstances, whereas the rest of us were, you know, Americans pretty much that grew up and went to, got the chance to go to college and then work for a corporation. Um, Doug Lytle was one of my roommates. Actually, he and I roomed together the first two years that I was here because I knew him from Lehigh from uh, before. Uh, I actually didn't come here until I had my master's degree, so he had a head start on me. <laughs> uh, but we had uh, got reacquainted, and uh, we roomed together the first two years. Um, let's see. Uh, Jim Chamberlain is, uh, had come from the graduate school. Um, he was an expert in uh, the beginnings of what you think of as video um, movement on the screen, things everybody takes for granted today in the video games and stuff. He's one of the people who developed that early on and uh, ended up uh, coming here. Um, but it was, uh, like I say, it was everybody had um, a wealth of background knowledge. That, that's one thing that, that definitely for RCA in general. Even a few of the, of the older engineers that I worked with who maybe didn't have necessarily a college degree or an advanced degree, the wealth of knowledge that we had in, in constructing and building that equipment and solving problems. Uh, there were so many times that we would just band together and work to get something out to that National Association and broadcast uh, uh, a convention every year get new technology rolling and working. How did you stay up with the technology? Well, in those days, uh, no internet, of course. We had, um, first of all, within broadcast, there was the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, so there, they published a journal. Uh, we had the IEEE journals on various topics, and technical magazines that have kind of gone by the wayside or have become... Uh, uh, web-based these days. Uh, I had already had uh, my master's degree, but a lot of RCA was very um, uh, supportive of people going and getting advanced education at Drexel or Penn and so on. So there were opportunities like that to stay abreast of the technology. And we were, uh, especially us younger guys, were... Um, taken along to all of these um, National Association of Broadcaster conventions or the SMPTE conventions twice a year, again, to see what the competitors are doing and to keep up with uh, the papers that were being presented. Talk about your supervisors. What were they like? Uh, my first supervisor was uh, Yuka Hamalainen, who went on to um, whenever RCA uh, ceased to exist, or at least the broadcast division did. He went on to um, uh, be a manager at Panasonic. And uh, uh, he was um, he's, he was from Finland, and he had a uh, tremendous background in television. Um, he was great to work with. He always called us fellows. That's, again, a, a family idea. It was always, fellows, fellows, we must get this research finished or we must get this circuit board done by the week, end of the week. Um, he was really good to work for. Um, uh, Dick West was another um, manager that uh, was uh, very dedicated toward getting things accomplished and done. Uh, as I remember, Lee Headland was head of the entire group of the tape world, and he was, uh, he ruled with a pretty good iron hand, because we got caught a lot of times coming back from Friday lunches, taking two hours, because we would ride over in a 
large nine passenger station wagon to some place in Philly to have lunch and come back and uh, he would be kind of looking and seeing us come down the hall so we all had to stay till you know 5 36 or whatever to be sure we had put in the the time how does they treat you uh i would say cer certainly fairly and uh more than just a manager employee kind of thing they were um quite often we were well for example uh the uh, bowling teams had a combination of managers and engineers. Um, so we, uh, we socialized as well as uh, working uh, on the projects. They were um, only demanding when, and, and it was a group kind of thing, we knew we needed to get things done and out of the door. Um, but nobody, rarely do we have any personal problems with uh, with any of the managers. Okay, now RCA Broadcast basically closed rather abruptly. Yes, it did. Did that mean you got laid off or what happened? Well, it was, uh, it was a real surprise. Um, I know for a, a couple of reasons that the abruptness came all the way from the top because Myself and a couple other engineers were scheduled to take a camera up to one of the vendor locations. I mean, a really extensive trip. And I know there's no way they would have planned that and had that up to the last second if, uh, if uh, they had any inkling that that was going to be closed and that project would become canceled. Um, what happened to... All of the engineers were either able, they either decided to go out on their own, but the rest of RCA was still in a hiring mode in most places. So I actually interviewed at Morristown and ATL and uh, the government side. And that's like, uh, because I had known uh, there was a, a large synergy between the government recording group and they were on the fifth floor and we were on the second floor of the old buildings. So myself, uh, folks like Tim Orman, um, Matt Tighe, and uh, a number of other engineers, I guess Tom Kasney would be one who's still here. Um, we, were, we were told if you just want to come up here and work, just come up here and work. <laughs> you can interview the other places if that's what you want to do, but there's we have plenty of openings up here. So. It turned out that it was just a very, um, just worked out well for everybody that all the engineers ended up being placed or if they decided to go out on their own, they did. But no one end, ended up losing a job in, in the engineering world anyway with the result of that closing. So it just was very fortunate timing. We also talk about RCA changing South Jersey. Do you have any opinions on that? Well, um, up until recently, I probably wouldn't have thought that much until I've been involved in um, a lot of um, acoustic amateur music in the last several years. And it's really rare if I don't run into somebody who says, oh, my dad worked at RCA, or they're, they're really aware of what it had meant at one time. Uh, so it definitely had an impact because it was such a large employer. I, I know long before I was here. And uh, that, as a result of that, it, it definitely had influence, uh, certainly in the older days. We have a lot of photographs here still in our cafeteria about the from the heyday when you realize how busy things were, but, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what is your view of RCA in the industry? What was their reputation? Um, how do they stack up against uh, the other companies? Uh, in broadcast, they were the premier uh, supplier of equipment and maintainers because of a 
well thought out approach to having the manufacturing and uh, a service company that was available something like 24, 48 hours on site. A great customer support, that type of thing. Uh, and in the government side, when I transferred over there, because we have maintained that, tried to maintain that reputation, uh, they were a, uh, a premier government supplier for the aircraft tape recorders, um, small ICBM, some other projects over the years that uh, the, the radar systems, I guess Gwen, the ground wave uh, emergency network. Uh, I never went any place that they didn't have a superior reputation like that. And I do have another little funny story. Uh, on one of the broadcast trips to, uh, of all places, um, imagine this being a place you'd have to travel in the middle of winter. The SMPTE convention was at Disney World. So we go to Disney World, and uh, I'm with one of the other managers on the way back. Um, we go in, and we have, in those days, there was a company called Travel Co. with an RCA, almost like uh, the RCA pencil I have here, with the logo on it. They had the RCA logo on our tickets. Of course, in those days, everything was tickets and the funky printing. So we walk up to the counter, and uh, the guy at the airline says, oh, RCA, we love you guys because you do the Space Mountain and this and then all the attractions and you support all that stuff so great. <laughs> the manager says, well, if you like us so well, why don't you bump us up to first class? And the guy goes, oh, yeah, no problem. Well, I assume he's joking, right? We get to tick, tick, we ticket it, go into the plane. We're in first class. <laughs> so we definitely had, uh, you know, RCA really meant something to the world. <laughs> Okay, Carl, um, any other things you want to talk about? Any uh, other recollections, any comments you want to make uh, before we wrap this up? Um, just that uh, I'm glad to see that there are efforts to keep RCA alive in a certain sense. Um, one of the things my father had, which is a cherished relic to me, I, I actually have not only an RCA small gramophone, but I also have a wax recording disc. In other words, a record maker. It's a lathe that you record a 78 and it'll play on any 78 machine. To think of the, the legacy of all that kind of stuff not getting lost in the modern world of uh, mm -hmm. dot coms and all the other uh, the things that are happening that, that uh, you know, I go, I'm glad to see efforts like that and uh, would hope that that kind of thing would continue because that's... Um, you now work for L3. You've been through all the transitions. Um, is there any residual of the RCA family that you can still see or feel around here? Uh, a, a little bit. Um, uh, most of the folks in upper management right now were with RCA at some point. Um, and uh, we still have softball games. We still have some, um, maybe once a year we have a, a little picnic thing outside. Um, I guess it's uh, it's not completely uh, been eliminated, but I think that's because the the people are still uh, a lot of us are still here and uh, are interested in that kind of thing, softball tournament, things like that, keeping that stuff going. 